our topic this morning, the justification of life and the faith of Jesus. If you notice the theme for our conference, it's living faith. And in the title of our study this morning, we have life and we have faith. What we've just heard this morning is a description of the life that faith brings. Right? The dead bones can live. We mentioned in passing in our previous study about the importance of life and the importance of faith for life. And do not forget the story of the fig tree. It died to illustrate the absence of faith. That's why Jesus said in response to Peter's statement, look, the tree is dead. Jesus' answer was, literally in the Greek, have faith of God. Have faith of God. May we understand that better as a result of our study this morning as well as we look at the justification of life and the faith of Jesus. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we come to you this morning. We acknowledge that in ourselves we are dust. But actually you created the dust as well. And you put it together with your breath and you created human beings. So without your spirit, we're dust. May our glory be laid in the dust as we understand the essential nature of the topic we're looking at today. May we understand it correctly. May in our, our sinful minds, our, our damaged minds, may we not misunderstand it. Keep us from resting the scriptures to our own destruction. But may we find in them your life. And may we allow you to remove preconceived ideas and preconceived opinions that remain as barriers in our mind, even idols that we worship. But may your word be sharp like a two-edged sword, and may it cut from us those things that would, that would lead to death. And may we have your life truly this today by your word in Christ's name. Amen. Just by way of review, the faith of God is expressed to us in the faith of Jesus. Faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Will you allow me to reword this? Not to change scripture, but to reflect upon it. God's love hopes his intelligent creatures will accept his plan and provides substance of that in how he treats his creatures especially his word of promises and commands, and especially to fallen, fallen sinners, those fallen creatures. And God's love sees what physical eyes cannot see of his plan and provides evidence for that, likewise, in how he treats his creatures, especially his word of promises and commands, and especially to fallen sinners. So Jesus came as an expression of that word in flesh to demonstrate the faith of God to sinners. What did God's love in its faith function through Jesus give as substance and evidence to sinners in regard to this thing the Bible calls justification of life? What does the Bible mean by justification of life? I'd like to take you on a journey, again, a Bible study, through some word families in the Bible. 
I'm going to introduce you first to the Justify family. If you've never done these studies, I encourage you to do your own. The Bible has two families of words, one Old Testament and one New Testament, dealing with this concept of justify and the words related to it. In the Old Testament, it is the family TSDQ. The Hebrew has no vowels. Those are the consonants. But it's the word that's translated just, righteous, justify, justice, and righteousness in the Old Testament. You might recognize some of these verses. Let's take a sample. There's at least 40 verses of the verb in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. The judges shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. If you went to court, is this not what you would want to see a judge do? Especially if you were the plaintiff or if you were the defendant? You would want a judge who would justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Otherwise, there would be a perversion of justice. But notice the opposite of justify. What is it? Condemn. Hang on to that because that's going to go all the way through the Bible. Job 25 verse 4, then the question arises, how then can man be justified with God? Do you think those in the Old Testament understood our need, our sinfulness? Isaiah 45, verse 25, In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Do you see why Isaiah is called the gospel prophet? How are you justified? In yourself? Absolutely not. In the Lord justified. And because of that, in him, what are you to do? Glory. First angel's message. The message of Daniel to Belshazzar. The God in whose hand your breath is, you have not glorified. Belshazzar was a sinner. Daniel was too. Daniel knew in whose hand his breath was. We heard about that in a previous study. Who gives us life? Do we deserve it as sinners? Isaiah 53 verse 11, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall do what? Bear their iniquities. Did you know you're not bearing your iniquities? Oh, you, you, you have some consequences that you're dealing with. God doesn't remove them all or you wouldn't know how bad it was. But if you want to know how bad it is, your sin, my sin, the sin of Adam, you don't go to the consequences in your life. You go to the cross. He was bearing your iniquities. Isaiah 53, 11. Daniel 8, 14 of all verses. Did you know it's in this family? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Same verb. It occurs only one other time in Daniel. This is an amazing insight for you to help, to, to help you to understand the prophecies. The only other time this verb is in Daniel is Daniel 12, verse 4. Do you know what it says there? Those that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. That word righteousness is not a noun. It is the verb form of our verb of this family. Righteousness is a noun form, but that's not being used there. So put those two texts together, Daniel 8, 14 and Daniel 12, 4. They go together. They're talking about the same point in the process of the plan of salvation. Let's turn to the New Testament and look at a family of words there because that's where our title comes from. This family is the D-I-K family in the Greek. It also is just, righteous, justify, justice, righteousness, and justification in the New Testament. We'll look at some of the verses that deal with this verb, justify, and the noun justification. Actually, the verb is seven times in the Gospels, one time in the book of Acts, 15 times in the book of Romans. 
six times in chapter 3. Where might we end up today? Three times in James and one time in Revelation. And hopefully we'll land there if we have time. Let's look at some sample verses. Matthew 12, 37 and Luke 18, 14 are the only ones with Jesus speaking of people being justified. Might those be important verses to understand? Let's look at the, word, the role of, of, of words in both of these passages where Jesus is talking. Matthew 12, 37, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Sounds like that first text we look at from the Old Testament, right? You have justification and you have condemnation. And you have sort of a judgment scene where you have one option, you're, you're guilty or you're innocent. But what is it? By thy words. Luke 18 verse 14 is the other passage where Jesus mentions this. It's in a parable. I pulled the verse from the parable. Do you recognize the parable by the verse? This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Who was he describing? Who was this man? And what made the difference between him and the other? You know the story. There's some words, right? There are some words that this man says. By thy words. What were the words in the story? that this man said. Well, from this word that this man said, that Christ said enabled him to go to his house justified, by this one word in Luke 18, we're going to follow a short sidetrack side of another amazing family of words. And that sidetrack is going to take us back to the highest occurrences of the word justify that we mentioned already in Romans chapter 3. So let's look at the sidetrack. The key verb is this, Luke 18, verse 13. The word that this man said that enabled him to be justified is this, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. By your words, you shall be justified. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And let's begin to compile this small family that we're looking at on this sidetrack. God be merciful to me, a sinner is the first phrase. Once more that verb occurs in the New Testament, only one time. Only one time. It's in Hebrews 2 verse 17. Open your Bibles to Hebrews 2 verse 17. Hebrews 2 17. Who do you, who do you think well, what is the book of Hebrews all about? To whom is Paul writing? He's writing to the Hebrews. What is he doing with the Hebrews in this letter? He's taking them through the Old Testament. And he's introducing who to them? The one about whom the entire Bible testifies. Right? And this one... He mentions here in verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him, the one he introduced in the very beginning of the book, Jesus Christ, to be made like unto his brethren. And what was the purpose of that? Why must he be like us? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to do what? To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There's the verb. God be merciful to me a sinner. Christ is making reconciliation. Same verb. For the sins of the people. For the sins of who? The people. Who are the people? For whose sins did he die? Ours. And we'll look at the verbs, the verses that cover that over and over again. So there's the other phrase that we're compiling in the small family. These are the verbs. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Make reconciliation for the sins. But there's a noun relative in this family. This noun relative occurs only twice. 
And this is in this noun is in the writings of John. First John 2, verse 2. You know what verse 1 says? I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have a Advocate, that's that high priest with the Father, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Do you see the picture that the Bible is developing for us? Later in the same letter, 1 John 4.10, the only other occurrence of that noun. Again, herein is love. Not that we love God. It doesn't start with you. It doesn't start with me. What are we dependent on? But He loved us, and He sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Same word, reconciliation, the noun form. So, let's add to that small family the verb in the first two, the noun in the second two. Are you getting the picture of what Jesus said about your words that will justify you? Are you going to be like Job and try to say, I'm, I've taken care of the poor and I've helped the widow and you end up justifying yourself? Is that how you become justified? We slip into that so easily. In the judgment, the words that will justify us is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be reconciled. What will he say in response? That's the question. But one more now in this family related but a little bit different in this small side family that we're looking at. It only occurs twice as well. Hebrews 9, verse 5. This is interesting. Same letter that we were looking at before. And this, of course, where is Paul going to illustrate the shadows of Jesus and his sacrifice? He goes to the sanctuary. The Hebrew sanctuary. And he's describing how those shadows are pointing to a reality. Of course, he's wanting to introduce them to the reality because the reality is much better than the shadow, right? If you have a picture of a spouse or a family member or a friend, how does that compare to the family member or the friend? One is a shadow and the other is the reality. Let's not get enamored with shadows, but let's always realize what they point to. It's about him. Hebrews 9, 5. What was the shadow here? The cherubim of glory were shadowing what? The mercy seat. That is a related noun to those others that we looked at and to the verbs that we considered. One more time it occurs. One more time. It's in Romans 3, which is the highest density of the word justify that we're going to look at. 3 verse 25. Whom, again speaking of the one Paul was introducing the Hebrews to, the one that he had met on the Damascus Road, the one that all the scriptures testify of, whom God set forth a propitiation, the translators put. It's the same word as the Hebrews 9, 5. He's the mercy seat. He is the lid. He's the covering. But think about that. Actually, he's the ark, too. He's the box. But in the lid part of the box, there's a unique function. The lid is a covering. Do sinners need covering? Well, that's echoed back clear to Genesis 3, right? Adam and Eve knew immediately they needed a covering because they saw what? They were naked. The self-focus that sin had brought them, they were all looking at themselves. So Adam didn't go to make clothes for Eve and Eve for Adam. They were making clothes for themselves. Again, their selfish focus. And when they hid themselves, they hid themselves. It wasn't looking out for the other. But God came down and gave them a better covering, right? A better covering required of the death of an animal in that shadow that he gave them. So Christ comes as the covering for the ark. But think about it. Does the ark, why does the ark have a covering? What's inside the ark? One of the things that's there are the tables of the law, which reflect... God's unselfish love in codified form. Here's what it looks like. And that unchanging standard of unselfish love condemns the sinner. And that law needs no covering, but the sinner does. And so 
picture the lid to the box, not covering the, the law, but covering the sinner that came in there once a year. Because he's having to put what on that lid every time he comes? He's having to put blood. Do you remember what we studied before? What's in that blood? There's faith in that blood. In the pouring out of the life of Jesus Christ, he has demonstrated faith working by love. And so the two symbols of faith and gold combine to show what God is doing for the sinner. This is all about what God is doing for us, right? Sinners. And the words that we should be speaking that lead to justification are acknowledging our sin and our dependence on His mercy and the need for reconciliation that He has provided. This is what we've been looking at. So, there's the small family. Be merciful, make reconciliation. And they're struggling for words, I think, in the English, and they use propitiation over and over again. And, well, of all things, mercy seat. Speaking of that piece of, part of a piece of furniture there in the sanctuary, in the most holy place, no less. So let's move back to this Justify family and where that other family landed us back in Romans 3. Let's consider Romans 3 verses 20 to 26 and I'm going to give it to you in Young's literal translation um, for several reasons. And as we look at this passage, I would encourage you to look for these things. Number, number one, the faith of Jesus is mentioned three times. Wow. Three times in a few verses. The, word, the verb justify is mentioned three times. And the word righteousness, which is the noun form of justify, again, if you deal with other languages, you know that, like Portuguese, there's no word righteousness, it's justice. Right? Just, justify, and justice. Adjective, verb, and noun. But righteousness is the one in the English, and that's the one we're more familiar with. So let's, let's look for those as we go through these verses. And watch carefully because Young will translate faith of Jesus more consistently than even the King James Version does. He's going to use declare righteous for the verb justify. And he's going to use propitiation as the other verses in King James uses for mercy seat. Verse 20, Romans 3. Wherefore, by the works of the law shall no flesh be declared righteous, justified before him. Why? The law wasn't given to justify sinners. It's an impossibility. Because the law is just. And it condemns sinners. So don't use the law to try to justify anybody, including yourself. Or anything that you do that appears to you to be in harmony with that law. Don't use it for that. It's not for that. It's to condemn you. That's the purpose of the moral law. Not just the shadows of the sanctuary showing you your need as a sinner, but the moral law especially, in the words of Ellen White, is what Paul is talking about in Galatians 3.24. The law was a schoolmaster especially the moral law, to show you your need and to drive you where? To a Savior. To a Savior, which is symbolized by everything else there in the sanctuary too. The law is actually within his heart, by the way. Psalm 40, 40 verse 8, the Messiah says, Thy law is within my heart. So, beautiful mixture of metaphors there in the sanctuary. The law is by the means by which we learn what sin is and how sinful we are by the laws the knowledge of sin verse 21 and now apart from law <clears throat> hath the righteousness of God been manifested testified to by the law and the prophets Paul had grown up as Saul with the law and the prophets did he understand the gospel no he ended up being a Pharisee in the righteousness which was in the law he was blameless but it was all external. He didn't realize the corruption of his heart, the covetousness that was there, breaking the 10th commandment, but thinking he was righteous. 
But as he learned to understand that the scriptures testify of Jesus, and as he met Jesus on that road to Damascus and had his orientation totally changed, he realized that the law and the prophets testify of a righteousness of God that is apart from law, apart from what you do in reflecting or attempting to reflect or not even attempting to reflect the righteousness of God. Verse 22, the righteousness of God, which is what? Through the faith of Jesus Christ. And that reaches how far? To, to all. Again, prepositions are important. To is ice. Unto all. Into all. It's, it's, it actually reaches all. But then there's added another prepositional phrase. And upon, epi, upon all those this is, this is continuous, believing, right? Notice that, believing. For there's no difference. What is no different? Between those that believe and, and all? No, there's a difference between those that believe and all because not all believe. But what is the no difference? Verse 23, for all did sin. That's the no difference. All did sin and all are and come short. This is, this is his literal translation. And all are come short of the glory of God. Don't think that by attempting to obey God, you have equaled the pattern. Your only hope is in Messiah. You will not be approved of God unless you copy the pattern. But never ever think that you equal it. Your only hope is not in yourself. No matter how long you live as a believer, Verse 24, being declared righteous. Now, who's the subject of this? He's been talking about all, right? Being declared righteous. There's the verb, justify. Freely, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Where is He pointing us back? To that high priest, making reconciliation for the sins of the people. To that one He sent, His Son, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Do you see the gospel truths that he's pointing here? Verse 25, whom God did set forth a mercy seat. There's that other family of words, the propitiation, the reconciliation. It's the bridge, right? Between heaven and sinners. How did God bridge the gulf between himself and sinners? He sent his son, and his son was the bridge. The ladder that Jacob saw in his vision, that's the only connection between heaven and earth. This is just another metaphor, the mercy seat. Through the faith in his blood. Do you see it there? This is not my faith in his blood. This is his faith that he revealed to us in pouring his life out. That's the faith of Jesus. Don't turn the gospel upside down and make it my faith in Him. It's His faith, as we read yesterday, in sinners, those for whom He died. For the showing forth of His righteousness. Again, you and I have a need. He's not showing our righteousness. He's showing our sin by taking it on Himself and showing His righteousness. This faith and love dying for us. Verse 20. Uh, continuing 25, because of the passing over of the bygone sins and the forbearance of God. Study the forbearance of God. If, if that's something that you and I need as sinners, is forbearance. We're much harder on others than God is. We're much harder on ourselves than God is. We don't know what forbear means. We want justice. Especially when we've been wrong. Do you know you have to go to the cross for justice? Don't look for justice from your neighbor or even a human court, go to the cross for justice. Just as you go there for mercy for yourself, go there for justice for this person who's wronged you. That's the only place to find it. Go there. Does God ignore sin? No. He forbears. Big difference. Big difference. God is not excusing sin. 
Calvary shows you that. God is not excusing sin, but He forbears. Learn what God's forbearance means to you, and then show it to others. Verse 26, For the showing forth again, he's, he's redundant, he's a lawyer, right? For the showing forth of His righteousness in the present time, for His being, here, here's, here's a collection of these words, man, just all in one verse. For His being righteous, there is the adjective, and declaring Him righteous, there's the, there's the verb, who is of the faith of Jesus. There's only one way to be declared righteous, and that's through the faith of Jesus. So, back to the diagram we used yesterday. And let's see how it fits, and see if the diagram is valid. These, this is the diagram. By the way, yesterday, on one of my slides, I had Revelation 3.10 for the righteous, the faith of saints. It was 13.10. And so it's correct on this slide, and it was on all the other ones yesterday, too. But here's the picture of a creative and responsive faith that we considered. Originating in the faith of God, the faith of Jesus manifested in the blood that He shed for us, and then the responsive faith, the faith of saints. Um, verse, Revelation 13, 10, and that faith that directs us to put our dependence on Christ, faith in Christ, because it's there in Scripture as well, that response of faith. Do you see it? There's the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus to all, Romans 3. That's the creative faith. And it, it is upon all those believing. There's the response of faith, Romans 3. Romans 4. Let's note briefly in Romans 4, God's calling Abraham in the promise he gave him. And of the death and resurrection of Jesus in this chapter. And the chapter talking about Abraham's response and the importance of our response. And of another ver word that we won't get into, but it's this word impute. To reckon, to count. Sort of how God does business, right? Sort of like in an accounting term. But what is he imputing? Well, we saw this yesterday. Verse 17, Abraham, before him whom he believed, Abraham is a man of faith, he, had, he responded to God's command, God's promise, God's faith, by doing what he could. Um, he believed, even God who quickens the dead, there's the subject that we looked at in the last message. If you want life, you want the justification of life, when, you're, when, you, when you are dead bones, or you feel like it, or anybody else around you is, where do you go? God quickens the dead. And He calls those things which be not as though they were. Verse 22, drop down there. Therefore it was imputed to Abraham for righteousness. What was imputed to Abraham? His faith. That faith response was imputed to Abraham for righteousness. God counted it for that. It's like this. Christ sees a lame man. And what does He say to a lame man? Take up your bed and walk. Is, is it possible for that layman and himself to do that? No. What is Christ's word giving the layman? Well, we say it's a command, yes, but it's a vision of what that man can do. Not in his own strength, but in the strength of the word of Christ. Right? And that man, that man responds to that word. He believes what Christ believes. And what happens? He gets up and walks. And what does Christ then often say to these people that He healed? Your faith has healed you. He's imputing righteousness to sinners. He's imputing health to those who have been stricken with disease. Verse 24, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, it's not just Abraham, us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Is a response necessary on our part? If the lame man had not believed he could walk, would he have walked? No. 
God has to wait for a response. Love does not force things on people. Faith does not force. Verse 25, who, this is the one whom we must believe, who delivered, I'm sorry, he raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. We believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered, Jesus, for, in the, and again the preposition is through or on account of, dia, he was delivered for our offenses, on account of our offenses. It was our sins that led to his being given up, being delivered, dying on the cross. And then what does he say? And he was raised. Same preposition, again, on account of our justification. The fact that, that his death established the justice of God. The fact that his death was effective for the sins of the whole world in accomplishing justification. That fact was affirmed in his resurrection. If he had not accomplished that, he would not have been raised. That is the justification of life. So do you see it? Our offenses led to his being offered, delivered, in our justification that was accomplished on the cross led to him being raised. And what should that do? It should, as with Abraham, it should lead us to believe on him. And then that faith response can be imputed to us for righteousness. There's the picture that I see in Romans 4. Well, let's move on into Romans 5 and briefly consider what that is. Let's note the need in Romans 5. We're not going to go through a lot of verses here, but the need in Romans 5 that was created in all of us because of Adam's sin and what God has done to meet that need. Verse 16, not as it was by one that sinned, that's Adam, so is the gift. That's in contrast, the gift in Christ. For the judgment was by one, that's Adam, to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto what? Justification, there's our word. And do you see the contrast again between condemnation and justification? It's there. Same thing we started with in the Old Testament. Jesus is not doing away with the legal system he gave to Israel. He is fulfilling it. And at the same time being able to be just and the justifier of sinners. But again, he's justifying sinners, not sin. Verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, Adam again, much more they which receive... There's the human response. The abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. There's our family of words. They shall do what? Reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. There's that negative outcome. Even so by the righteousness. Again, there's the noun of one. The free gift came upon who? all men unto justification of life. There's the other noun directly related to righteousness and the verb justify. So how does this look in our diagram? The free gift in His Son, Jesus Christ. The free gift to, all, to how many? To all. It's unto justification. I put justification on this side of the circuit because that word there is often translated righteous deeds. It is Romans 8 verse 3, uh, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is the word righteousness that's translated in, in Revelation 19, that the bride has made herself ready, and she's clothed herself. And that garment is the righteousness of saints. Dikaiomata, it's the, it's the plural of righteous deeds. And the response was mentioned in that passage, as we said. They have received that gift, that gift of righteousness that came to us without any conditions in Jesus Christ, any conditions of our having to meet it before, before He gave it, unconditional only in that sense. And they're going to reign in life. There's a solution for death, right? There's the justification of life. The dead bones can live. 
The righteousness of one has come upon all men unto justification of life. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Why are we alive? It's because of the life giver. Do you know you can go to anybody and tell them that? That is what should power evangelism. That is why Paul could go to any village and there would be converts there. They would realize everything good they had, including life, had come to them through the cross of Jesus Christ. Spread the good news. 2 Corinthians 5 in closing. God was in Christ, verse 19, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, not imputing their sins. Well, we, he's in the business of imputing what? Righteousness. He wants to, he doesn't want to impute sins to people because that means death. And he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation, verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Verse 21, for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. That's our noun again being made the righteousness of God. So he's reconciling the world to himself, this creative faith. He's not imputing their trespasses to them. That's this, this creative faith working by love. And what is the imperative? Respond. Believe what he believes. He's been reconciled to you in Christ. Be reconciled. Accept the gift. He made him to be sin for us. Praise God. Praise God that we might be made the righteousness of God. Where? In Him. In Him. So, what if we leave out the second half of that? Is it danger? What if we change the first half into God does not condemn? Jesus said to the woman, I do not condemn you. If we leave out, he condemns sin in the flesh. What happens when that comes? If we take this universal dimension of God's love, the world, and his life to all, and warp it, it has a danger. You know what it's called? The counterfeit of agape in its justification of sinners is free love in its justification of sin. And if you don't understand that, study the definition of free love, it is rampant in our society. It is a teaching of spiritualism. And it invaded Adventism in the 1890s and 1900. And it came out in the teachings of John Harvey Kellogg. Is my time up? Five minutes. Uh, bear with me and I'll take you through a quick journey. Our history in the 90s and into 1890s and 1900s. 1903. To those who would represent every man as born a king, to those who would make no distinction between the converted and unconverted, to those who are losing their appreciation of their need of Christ as their Savior, I would say, think of yourselves as you have been during the period of your existence, as an open book. Would it be pleasant or agreeable for you to contemplate feature after feature of your life work in the sight of him who knows every thought of man? and before whose eyes all man's doings are as an open book? Do you see the only answer to us is that we do what that man in the parable did? God be merciful to me, a sinner. And the teaching of John Harvey Kellogg was destroying that realization of a need of a Savior, of, of a need to respond with the words that will justify you, which is a total dependence upon him. This is letter 240, 1903, paragraph 17. Um, it's in a letter, it's in uh, Loman and the Messages, page 254, 253.4, this one paragraph. Actually, it was first written in a 60 paragraph letter to Kellogg um, in October, October 6, letter 232. And then it's in the shorter 19 paragraph letter to medical students and nurses. Was Kellogg influencing medical students and nurses? Obviously, and she was trying to intervene in what was happening. God help us. 
So, to emphasize the universal realities of God's initiative, the love, the life, the justification, must not lessen the reality of our sinfulness and the need of a new birth. We've only got half a circuit, and we've short-circuited the entire plan of salvation. And there's no need for Christ, our Savior. That's where Kellogg's teachings were leading. Destroying the need for the atonement, the lessons of the sanctuary. Upon all men unto justification of life must go with God be merciful to me a sinner, then in the end you'll be justified. The next year, 1904, the open path, the safe path of walking in the way of his commandments is a path from which there is no safe departing. And when men follow their own human theories, dressed up in soft, fascinating representations, they make a snare in which to catch souls. In the place of devoting your powers to theorizing, how many of us spend our time theorizing? And we're not out there helping sinners. Do you see the point? This was derailing the third angel's message. She said instead of the swelling to a loud cry, it was being smothered by medical missionary work that was based upon theorizing and sentiments from satanic sources. She said, God has, Christ has given you a work to do. His commission is go through and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Before the disciples shall compass the threshold, there is to be the imprint of the sacred name. Singular, right? In the name of Father, Son, and Spirit. Baptizing the believers in the name of the threefold powers in the heavenly world. The human mind is impressed in the ceremony. The beginning of the Christian life. It means very much. The work of salvation is not a small matter, but so vast that the highest authorities are taken hold of by the expressed faith. There's the response of the human agency. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the eternal Godhead, is involved in the action required to make assurance to the human agent to unite all heaven to contribute to the exercise of human faculties to reach and embrace the fullness, sorry for this long sentence, it's not mine, the fullness of threefold powers. Who is that? the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, to unite in the great work of appointed, the great work appointed, confederating these heavenly powers with the human that men may become through heavenly efficiency, partakers of the divine nature and workers together with Christ. Manuscript 45, 1904. It's a manuscript that is entitled that they, may, that they all may be one. May 14, 1904. There's a portion extracted in volume 6 of manuscript releases, 389. But again, thank God all of these manuscripts are available in their entirety. And we know the history. If you know anything about Adam's history, you know exactly where it fits into the story. We need vitally to understand these lessons. And we need the powers of all three of the heavenly trio. You noticed it there. In the Desire of Ages, she said that it is only by the power of the mighty the third person, the mighty third person of the Godhead that we can overcome sin. Do not believe anybody that depersonalize that mighty third person of the Godhead. So, one final occurrence, Revelation 22, verse 11. And then, this is a literal translation. This is the last occurrence of our, of our word. He who is acting, doing unjustly, let him be acting, doing unjustly still. These are verbs. They're all verbs. There's no adjectives in that phrase. The next phrase, and he who is defiling, being filthy, let him be defiling and being filthy still. God's letting you have what you've chosen through repeated choices, through habits of life. You've developed a character that is incorrigible. He's letting you go. But then the rest of the verse, he who is just righteous, there's the adjective, and here's the last occurrence of our verb. Let him be justified, declared righteous, still. You can lose your declaration of righteousness. Did you know that? You must keep the faith of Jesus to the end. As Paul says, I've kept the faith. And the last phrase, and he who is sanctified, let him be sanctified still. God help us that we will receive of the enormity of the gift ally ourselves with the three great heavenly powers 
for the work that's been given us, not just out there, but in here as well, in our hearts. That we can be on the right side of this declaration at the end. That's my prayer. Is that yours too? Let's close. Father, thank you for revealing to us your gift to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to understand the importance of our response. That your gift, your love, and your faith through Christ does not force us. It waits for a response. May we respond wholeheartedly. And as you show us more of the sinfulness of our hearts, may we not hold any part back, but may we walk with you. And as Abraham was, learn what a friend you are. And that you then finally can say about us that you know us and we're your friend. Cleanse us, Lord, and through us help us to bring cleansing to other people's lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen.